All right, if those of you at the door would come in, come in, come further up, come further in. Thank you for the few lucky people that got that. All you folks standing up, there's plenty of space down here. They're like, we're going, we're leaving, we're going upstairs. Okay, you can close the doors now. Dr. McDonald is in the house. So. <laughs> and they listen to me. It's amazing. There are a few more people coming in. See, when it rains, everybody gets a little bit behind. That's all right. I understand that. I want to welcome you this lovely early fall morning to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. On this day in history, Jean Roddenberry was born in 1921. I know, isn't that awesome? He flew B-17 bombers during World War II, flew commercially for Pan Am after the war, and served as an officer with the Los Angeles Police Department. But it may not surprise you to know that what he really wanted to do was write. He resigned from the LAPD in 1956 and began writing full time. In 1964, he developed the idea of a new series about space exploration and shopped it around to several studios, most of which were uninterested. Desilu Productions, the company run by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, finally expressed an interest and NBC agreed to run it. The pilot aired on September 8, 1966. Ratings were never great, only aired for three seasons, but it was a huge success in syndication and has gone on to inspire an animated series, four spin-off live action TV series, and 13 movies. I have to admit that I geeked a little while researching this and read a fan list of the best movie, and um, it's The Wrath of Khan, just in case you're... Khan! Anyway. Of course, this is Star Trek, the first sci-fi series to dare depict a generally peaceful future. And that came from Roddenberry's optimism about the human race. Since we have kind of a Calvinist background, we won't talk about that. But The Star Trek characters kept justifying the human race's existence, and I rather like that about them. Today is a special day because we honor one of our own. Every year, faculty members at King vote for two students to give lectures the following academic year. Today's student lecture, notice I'm not saying his name because I just thought, I'm going to let Bill handle that, <laughs> has asked Dr. Bill Linderman to introduce him. Bill joined the math department at King in, in 1999. Like Roddenberry's better characters, Bill is, no, not, not half human, half Vulcan, <laughs> a Renaissance man. He has the skill of a concert pianist. He knows about ancient Mayan, Incan, and Chimer mathematics, and he can teach you about cryptology. He is active in his field and dedicated to teaching. <clears throat> Bill can also outrun you, especially over long distances. And finally, Bill loves to travel and explore and to search out new places. Please join me, join me in welcoming Bill, and may everyone here live long and prosper. Good morning. His name is Josias Gomez, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce him as this semester's student lecturer. It's an honor to be chosen by the faculty to give this lecture, and it's no surprise to me to find out that there are others on the faculty who have learned what I have learned, that this is an extraordinary young man, intelligent, hardworking, friendly, cheerful. I'm sure there are other Boy Scout adjectives that apply. <laughs> um, but I think one of his greatest strengths is his exuberance. Hoseus has a zest for life. He makes the most of the talents and opportunities he's been given, and he does so with energy, enthusiasm, and grace. 
The Westminster Catechism tells us that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I think Hosea exemplifies this in a very visible way. If you were to ask any King professor what we like most about our jobs, I'm almost certain that most of us would say something about working with students. Sure, we all love grading papers and filling out assessment forms. <laughs> but it's interacting with students and helping them succeed that makes our jobs meaningful. When I have a student like Hoseas, a student who has natural ability for understanding mathematics, who works hard, who is appreciative and respectful, and who actually enjoys learning mathematics, it makes for a truly rewarding experience. Now, it may be hard for some of you to believe that anyone could actually enjoy learning mathematics, but Hoseas has that gift, and it's been my privilege to be able to work with him and uh, teach him and help him learn about this complex and rich subject. The first time I had Hoseas in a class was in my graph theory course over a year ago. Earlier this spring, he and I and another student, Sammy Austin, began working on a research project from that course. Almost every Wednesday afternoon in the spring, we got together and worked on problems, which is really remarkable that to have students who were willing to do this when it wasn't part of a grade or part of a course. They each went on to present a poster at a regional math conference as um, part of their work based on the work that we had done. There was one afternoon in particular when we'd been working on a problem for several weeks and we had made progress but we just couldn't get it to work and right before we were about to leave for the day all of the pieces fell into place and we saw the solution. It was a eureka moment and it was one of those times when the lines between mentor and student become blurred because we had all collaborated on this problem. I think that afternoon, that victory, will be one of the standout moments in my memory of working with Hoseas. So thank you for that, Hoseas. Hoseas Gomez was born and raised in Honduras. His church in Honduras had a partnership with a church in Memphis. And one summer, when a group from that church in Memphis visited Honduras, he met a lovely young lady named Christina. And he tells me he moved to Memphis to pursue her. They married, and it was her job as a Spanish professor at Keene that brought them to Bristol. And the Keene community has certainly been blessed by both of them. I have one other thing to say, a, a confession really, which we're told is good for the soul. And my confession is that I have only just started calling him Hoseas because I learned to call him Josias when I had him in class that first time in that graph theory course over a year ago. And I asked him about this recently as I was preparing for this morning. And, and frankly, it's a little embarrassing to say, yes, I would be glad to introduce you, but what is your name? <laughs> <laughs> now, on the first day of class, I, in a new semester, when I call the roll and I have new students, I always try to ask for help. I ask the students to let me know what name they would like to be called and how to pronounce it. I want to get it right. I want to get it right from the beginning because if I get it wrong, at least for me, it's very hard to correct. And either though neither one of us remember exactly what happened that first day in graph theory, Hoseas tells me that he used to tell Americans that his first name was Josias um, because that was a lot easier for us. Um, and so when I asked him recently about this, Hoseas versus Josias, he said a lot of people call him Josias, and then he's fine with that. And in fact, he said his nickname in Honduras was something like Josiah or Josie or something, an English version of his name, and that he was used to it and comfortable with it, and it was fine. It was all good. Well, in typical fashion, he was being very accommodating and gracious, but he wasn't really answering my question. <laughs> or more accurately, I wasn't really asking the right question. So I approached it from another angle, and I said, if you were to introduce yourself to someone that you met today, what would you tell them your name is? And he said, Hoseas. He said he found out that Americans really can learn to pronounce it. <laughs> Even those of us in Bristol. And so because of that, I want to call him Hoseas. Out of respect for someone that I admire and someone who has always made an effort to do his best. So finally, Hoseas, I want to say to you, and this is with a lot of help from Dr. Maison, estoy orgulloso de ti, 
de todos tus logros y de tu carácter. Muchas gracias por ser tan buen estudiante y por hacer que mi trabajo como profesor sea tan gratificante. I am proud of you for your accomplishments and for your character. Thank you for being such a good student and thank you for making my job as a professor so rewarding. His name is Josias Gomez. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming him as this semester's student lecturer. Good morning, everyone. I mean, I'm, I was tearing up with, with this introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Linderman. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone who is here today, the faculty and staff and all the student body. And my family is actually watching online as well. So, hola, mami, papi, como se? Um, it is, I'm so honored that the faculty chose me for this student lecture. And thank you, thank you very much. So today I'm gonna to be talking about becoming a greater person that makes a greater difference. And the reason why I chose this topic is because it's something that is really close to my heart and that involves my personal experience, my background, it involves my time at King, it involves my faith. And those three things combined make who I am today. So, first, you know in the academic world, we always try to define what we mean with our words. You know, every time we do a research paper, okay, what does that mean? So I want to define what becoming a greater person means. And I want to do it with a story that comes from, from Matthew in the Bible. You see, John, John and James came to Jesus and, and talk to him and ask him, will you do whatever we ask? And Jesus was like, okay, tell me about it. And they were like, when we're in your kingdom, can one sit at your, on your left side and one sit to your right? And Jesus was like, you know, those things are not really for me to give, those are for the Father. And those are already established. But the other 10 disciples heard what, what these two asked for and they got really, really upset. They were, you know, indignated with, with what they asked. So Jesus calls them all together. Oh. Technical problems, I guess. <laughs> Jesus calls them all together and says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So today, my, my definition for becoming greater, for being greater, is to become a servant. And I'm gonna give you three examples today of what, the, what, it, what it means for me to become, to be a servant. And the first one has to do with me and my background. And I'm originally from Honduras. You know, it's a Central American country right in between Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. And I want to make emphasis in that because I had some people tell me before that Honduras was in Europe. It's not in Europe. <laughs> it is in Central America. <laughs> and, um, and it's a beautiful place. It's rich in, in history. And actually, I think the second biggest coral reef, the Mesoamerican coral reef, passes through the uh, uh, Atlantic coast of Honduras. So it's a great place to, to dive and, and snorkeling. And it's a beautiful place. And we also, the Mayan civilization was also in Honduras. So if you ever want to go visit and, and see these beautiful ruins, uh, I took my wife there, you know, trying to get her to marry me. So it, was, <laughs> it, it kind of works if you're trying to, you know, <laughs> get married. That's a good place to go. So it's beautiful, and the beach is beautiful. But in my case, I grew up in the capital city. I grew up in, right in the middle of the country, Tegucigalpa. And it's a very populated city, about two million plus people. So it's very crowded. and. Um, and you know, Honduras is a country in development, so it's not rich. And, and with that comes crime. 
there's a lot of crime there too. So when I was when I was in Honduras, I, I you know I, there's some places that you don't even want to walk. That if you're driving, you're looking around, make sure that you know no one's coming to get your wallet or put a gun in your face. So I learned how to handle myself pretty well in Honduras. And and with that, I want to tell you that I was I was a terrible kid when I was growing up. I mean I was. I was just hyperactive, and I used to get into trouble all the time. And for, for instance, one time, I remember, um, I don't know if you know, Christmas lights are not very reliable, so they go out all the time. So one time, I remember having this, I was like nine or 10 years old, and I had this big box of Christmas lights at my house. And for, for some reason, I, I thought I could fix them. You know, I thought, okay, I can fix this. Maybe, you know, I can, get the ones that are working with the ones that are not working and get them together, right? So I remember grabbing a knife and grabbing the big box and I just got under the dining table. I, I kind of knew it was, the wrong, it was the wrong idea, but anyway, I got under the dining table with a box, a knife, and I was ready to fix the screws. So I started peeling up the rubber at the cables and just like, you know, I started putting them together, tying them together, and I did that for some time. And of course, as any other scientist, once you, you finish your project, you want to test it, right? So I was like, all right, time to test my, my experiment. So I went ahead and plugged it in. Wow. The lights in the house started flashing, all these sparks and smoke burning. And I remember my mom like, comes like yelling, and my, my siblings come to the dining room, and they, and they help me getting out of the, the dining table. And my mom just gives me a hug. She was just... She was just happy I was, I was still alive. I mean, I could have gotten electrocuted. It was really a miracle. I remember seeing the sparks, and I was like stepping on some of these things probably, you know? I was like, wow. So there, the fact that I'm here today is really a miracle. <laughs> but that, that, is, that is God, you know? And, and that was the kind of kid I was. I was really this kid, and I was getting into trouble all the time. And, but God gave me really amazing parents. You know, my mom and dad have been wonderful. They were able to love me and handle me very well. And uh, the ones on your, on your left, uh, my mom and dad, and the ones on your, on your right um, are my sister and her husband, my brother-in-law. So this couple, I love them so much, and I hope they're watching this online because I want to honor them with this too because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. They, they sacrificed so much in their lives. You know, they, they, give out, they gave their time, their resources. They gave everything so that I could grow into a man that I am today. And um, also, I have a brother. So I have a sister and a brother. We're, we're a family of five. And that's my brother. And those two little boys are my nephews. They're the cutest things alive. They're, they're so beautiful and so pure. And I just, I just love spending time with them. This is a family picture at my sister's civil wedding, legal wedding. The thing is that in Honduras, we, we celebrate two weddings. We celebrate the legal wedding and we celebrate the ecclesiastic wedding. So we have two parties, you know, for one wedding. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. That's my family. And yes, my sister got married like two years ago and six months ago she had her baby. And uh, we have another wonderful addition to our family. Lucas, that's the name of, of, of my nephew. So this is my family. This is where I come from. You know, a family that, that has love and that, and that God has transformed too. Now, like Dr. Linderman said, you know, I moved to the States for a reason, right? And I'm obviously here with you today. And what happened is that I met this beautiful woman when I was in high school. And I fell for her. I did. <laughs> She went down in a mission trip down to Honduras, and um, we were working together. And you know, when you are helping people, and when you're next to a beautiful woman, it, it's just a beautiful experience. I was just, ex I mean, in ecstasy. <laughs> it was just amazing. We had a great time, and we became friends, you know, and then we started dating, and one thing led to another, and we got married at the beach in Destin. And that's why they moved. I pursued her to Memphis, like Dr. Linderman said. I was like, I can't leave by myself. I feel too empty in Honduras. I need to be with these women. So I followed her to the US. And, and her, I, my family became larger. You know, her family is a family of seven, and they became my family. 
And it's just been wonderful to be part of two different cultures and two different um, families, but one at the same time. And so I've been really blessed of being able to experience my Honduran family and being able to experience my American family. Now, this is the first example. I told I was going to tell you three different examples. And my family is the first one to how to be a servant because something I've learned from them is that they value me. And they value me. My parents and those around me have valued me more than themselves. You know, my mom and dad could have gotten a lot of things if they hadn't had me. You know, I, was, I mean, I was such a, such a bad kid sometimes that they could have given me away because <laughs> I was that bad. <laughs> But they didn't. You know, they love me. They sacrificed so much. And, and the Bible says, you know, in Philippians, Paul writes, do, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. So that's the first thing I learned from Father I want to share with you. If you want to be a servant, if you want to be great, if you want to become great, please invest your time and there is this, this prayer, you know, English is my second language, so I wrote prayers, but to invest time, prayer, and resources in others. You know, you might think, how can I help others? Just invest your time. If you can just spend time with another person, you know, you're serving them. You're, you're, you're saying that they're important, that they have value. And that's what my parents did for me. So that's the first example. Now, the second example, and you guys may recognize these pictures, is been my time at King. Uh, for you who are freshmen and um, for new faculty and staff, here at King, at the end of the year, we have a big time celebration. We have a big party that we call the late night breakfast. And in this party, we have gifts, we have eggs, bacon, biscuits and gravy. Oh, I mean, it's just so good. And we start at, late, at 10 o'clock at night, so it's like a you know, late night breakfast. And this is a wonderful time. Like, this is probably my favorite event at King University. Besides the, well, along with the ping pong tournaments and the kickball, those are good too. But this is my favorite one because I just have so much fun in it. Now, there's something really, really interesting about this, this event. And the interesting thing is that the people who are serving, those who are with an, do they put, put on an apron and serve the students are the teachers and the professors and the staff. All of those who are in authority at, at King University are the ones serving us. So it's very humbling for me to come and sit down at the table, you know, and have, and have a, 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 one of my, my, my mentors coming in and putting some juice in my, in my cup, you know, or bringing me some pancakes. I mean, it's just really humbling, you know, and, and I just really appreciate that because God really has shown me that to be, a lead, to, to be great, to be a servant means to to come back and serve others who are below us. And anyway, now our professors, they not only serve us, you know, once in a while. If you think about it, they serve us every day. They're, they're in classes, they're teaching you, they have office hours, they're teaching you, they're writing those recommendation letters for you to get that internship, for you to get that job that you need. You know, they're really investing their time in you, in me. And they have in me. This picture on your left is at the Blue Ridge Conference. We presented our research here at King. And then the one on the right is actually a trip that we took to Alabama to present our research at a math, at a math conference down there. And we had so much fun. It was a blast. You know, so the fact that people like Dr. Lenderman invest in me to help me grow, to help me be better, to learn more about the world and about math, you know, I really, I really love math, and it's, it's, it's huge. And that brings me to my third point, that to be a servant means to, to help others grow and make their lives better. And you might think to yourself, I'm a freshman, you know, I don't, have, I don't have a degree yet, I don't have very many resources, how can I help others, how can I make somebody else's life better? You know, you can just... You know, open somebody, open the door for someone. You know, pick something from the floor, help carry something. You know, spend time with people, like I said earlier, and that would help them grow. You know, or, or even if you if you if you like math like me, you know, I can go and tutor someone else and teach them what maybe the little more I know about math and help them grow. 
So there are ways that we can help others grow. And our teachers, our staff, they are a, an example of that. And um, now the third one I have is, it's probably the greatest one, it's the greatest one of all. And that is my faith. You know, I've talked about my family and I, I've talked about my experience at King and with academics. But also my faith is the third one that has really made who I am today. The Bible says, in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, says that Paul writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death and death in the cross. You see, Jesus, he came to die on the cross for our sins. And he gave his life. He came to serve all of humanity. You know, the reason, the reason my parents were great parents, the reason I'm here today, the reason we have this school today is because Jesus transformed the lives of people and really made us who, who we are. And maybe some of you have difficulties with it. Maybe you're like, you know, I don't know. I don't know about this. I'm not sure. You know, just look at my example. Really, the good in my life has been because of Jesus and his death in the cross and his salvation for me. That's the truth. You know, and, um, and I believe that. And he says that if you believe that, you will not perish, but you will have abundant life and eternal life. And that's my truth. And that's the most amazing act of service humanity had had. And... Um, And my third point is to consider others more important than yourself. The verse said that he was God, but he made himself a servant. You know, and he considered us that important. He being God, he didn't need us, but he became our servant. And that's what I want to tell you today. Like, if, if you can sometimes just put someone before yourself, you know, our culture, our society, no matter where you're in the world, you know, my culture is more collectivistic. But even in Honduras, sometimes people think more about themselves. You know, it's about me, what I can get, what I can gain. But God demonstrated to us that we can, we can put somebody else first. And when we do that, we build this, this beautiful relationship that flourishes into love forever. And these are the three things I want you guys to, to just to remember from me. You know, maybe I'll be forgotten in a few years. Nobody, nobody will know who I was. But those of you who, who know who I am, I'm Josias. I'm Honduran. I come from a beautiful family. But God transformed my life and everyone's around me. That's what I did. And thank you very much. Um, the Bible said, uh, this one thing I wrote, actually, I had forgotten. I had it there. But to be great is to be a servant of others. And those are the three things I want you guys to carry. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, we always award the student faculty lectures with a uh, plaque. And because I didn't need to uh, pronounce it correctly, it is spelled correctly, Josias. Um, so congratulations. Thank you so much. And you should really listen to what he says about your professors. That's the main takeaway there. OK. Um, so next Monday morning at 9.15, I hope you will return and join us for Sarah Groves. She is a Christian singer-songwriter. She'll be playing instruments along with the band. Um, so it should be really good. And what is going on with this thing? And uh, be kind. Have courage. Good day. <laughs>